broadcast of this program is made possible in part by the South Carolina Farm Bureau, online at scfb.org. And by the Columbia Metropolitan Airport, online at columbiaairport.com. And by Time Warner Cable, online at timewarnercable.com. And welcome back to State House today as the General Assembly continues this session. The House is preparing uh, for budget debates. The Senate uh, is getting ready to take up whether or not the Superintendent of Education should be elected by you, should be appointed by the Governor. We just finished a debate over a DUI type law uh, to have an interlocking device put on cars. We got an exciting show for you today because we're going to start dealing now with one of the issues that you hear about from Washington back to the states, the Affordable Care Act. Some call Obamacare, others not. Medicaid expansion, is that part of it? What does it do? Will it affect the hospitals? Will it affect your insurance? How will it affect the people you know that, that may be involved with Medicaid, either from receiving in or from employment in? But before we do that, we need to take care of some housekeeping uh, chores. And first of all, uh, we want to thank Time Warner Cable, we want to thank the Columbia Metropolitan Airport and the South Carolina Farm Bureau for sponsoring this program and making it available to you as a way to look at issues here at the State House. Also, we want to thank Educational Television, South Carolina ETV for their production of this broadcast, and the South Carolina Press Association for helping us in assembling uh, the materials and the, the subjects. So with that, I also would be wrong if I did not welcome uh, 518 of the Block Building. Very loyal audience over there, Representative Merrill and um, Zachary and Associates, it's a whole group of them. I think Representative Stavronakis has bragged about how informative this show is Thank and how it gives him easy answers to difficult questions. And with us today, we have two people, both of them experienced here at the State House. They're extremely knowledgeable. They're active on the floor. They're, they're, they're two very competent legislators who dig into issues and try to understand them. And so we asked them to come on the show today and give us some perspectives on Medicaid expansion. Are there alternatives to Medicaid? Is Medicaid sustainable? Uh, there's a lot of debate that we just can't sustain it whether we go through expansion or not. We're going to explore those things. So let me introduce both of them. Representative Gildakov Hunter uh, has been on this program before, and you've been vocal on Medicaid and expansion and things of that nature. Representative Merle Smith, been involved in health issues, understands insurance. He's been involved in the Medicaid issue, and he comes to us as somebody who is uh, really active here in the legislature. What they're going to attempt to do is to boil almost a two-hour program down into 30 minutes and at least try to tell you something about this subject. And I'll start with you. Medicaid expansion, why is that a subject today? Good morning, Governor, and thanks for having us on the show. It's a subject today mainly because it's the law of the land. And we have, uh, of the 50 states, we have 29 states that have decided that they'll comply with the law of the land. And I would suggest to you of those 20, 29 states, eight are led by Republican governors. It's the, it's on our conversation and topic today because it's something the states are having to deal with as we rightly should. And here in South Carolina, under the leadership of Merle Smith and others who are tasked with that responsibility, we've been trying to come to terms with how we are going to cover those South Carolinians across the state who are uninsured. All right, it's the law of the land, but the court has said the states have a choice. So I ask you, um, is that why it's now the issue. 
That's absolutely correct. And first, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you for allowing me on here. I've been one of those in Block 518 who's watched you from afar. And so now I can strike this off of my legislative bucket list that I've appeared on your show. So thank you for having me. It's such an honor. Um, let me, you're, you're absolutely correct. The Supreme Court ruled this summer that, that uh, the Affordable Care Act was constitutional. They had the power for the individual mandate, but left the option over, uh, open for the states and said it was unconstitutional for them to force an expansion of Medicaid. And so that's the issue that we have here. And let me also say that, the, that Governor Haley, and through her HHS uh, director, Tony Keck, has already it, uh, told HHS, the Federal Health and Human Services, that we are not going to expand our Medicaid. So that decision has been made, that's an executive decision, has been made. And they've done it for a number of reasons, the cost, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that here shortly. But the, it's, the issue now is in the legislature we're dealing with the budget, and there's obviously, as you heard Representative Cobb Hunter say, there's a push for expansion of Medicaid, and that's where the debate's coming about today. All right. And for our viewers so they can begin to understand why is there a question of expansion, let me kind of just preface it and I'm going to try to simplify what the Medicaid uh, thresholds are. In South Carolina, if you're a family unemployed with dependent children, you're 50% of the poverty level or less, you're qualified for Medicaid and are served. If you're employed with a family that's dependent and you're 90% of the poverty level, you are covered. Now, in between that, there are some adjustments for different types of medical conditions. If you a family without dependent children at the poverty level or less, or you're single at poverty level or less, you get nothing. That's where we are currently. Now, the new Affordable Care Act gives you the option, and, and, and let me preface this by saying that the general uh, formula is the state picks up 30 percent of the cost, the feds pick up 70. Under the Affordable Care Act, they're offering the states to go to 138 percent of the poverty level to expand the Medicaid. They will pick up 100 percent for the first two years and then start declining down to 90 percent. So there's an expense and that 90 and 100, as I understand it, only applies to those qualified from March 23rd 2010 going forward. That's kind of the basis to the public. So let me ask you, why do you think, and I'll start with you because you have the, I've seen your comments that you think it's in the state's interest. Why do you think it's in the state's interest to expand Medicaid? Well, and let me correct that figure I just gave you. I said 29. I meant 39 states have made the decision to go forward with Medicaid expansion. Eight of those states led by Republican governors. So here in South Carolina, unfortunately, we are in a shrinking minority as far as this coverage. I believe very strongly that it is it makes sense because we are talking about the ability to cover over 250,000 South Carolinians who are currently uninsured. The executive decision to not expand Medicaid means that roughly 185,000 South Carolinians who are currently living in poverty are not going to be covered. Even if one does not accept the argument that we ought to care about people not having insurance. It is hard for me to understand how in a state that prides itself on economic development, we can in good conscience turn down a potential economic impact of four, over four billion dollars. When I look in my district and in districts across this state that have double digit unemployment, the economic impact of us simply expanding Medicaid is one that I don't think we can afford to, to turn our noses up at. It has a serious economic impact. It means jobs across the board in the healthcare industry. And most importantly for me, it's being penny wise and pound foolish for us to say we can't afford to do it now, let's do it later. We live in South Carolina in a state with health outcomes that are 
not in the best uh, shape. We are chronically ill. We have poor uh, health decisions and that kind of thing. So we ought to, in my opinion, be focused on prevention, focused on education. Prevention is the most important aspect of the Affordable Care Act that I think we really are making a mistake in not expanding Medicaid. And finally, before I yield to my chairman, <laughs> it's not fair to the hospitals and to business for us to continue to shift the cost of uninsured care people showing up in hospital emergency rooms to hospitals and businesses and those people who have insurance because that's where it'll go to. Representative. Well, that's a lot, to, <laughs> a lot of issues there. It's I have to, your I perspective, have to, your perspective on why we shouldn't take but it. Let, let me just tell you, I, I, you know, I understand their position, but I think it boils down to financial issues here. And you know, first and foremost, we need to look at what Medicaid is and what it's, and what it's done over the past few years. That's the largest uh, driver in our budget over the last few years. If you extrapolate it out over 10 years, I think you would see about we've had a 26% growth year over year with, with this uh, Medicaid. And part of what the Affordable Care Act has done that, that some people aren't talking about, we talk about expansion. And that's an option, but there's also an option that, or there's also a mandate now under the Affordable Care Act that everybody's got to have insurance. And that's what you heard about that's called the individual mandate. Well, what's that going to do in South Carolina? We have a number of people who are eligible for Medicaid right now for one reason or another that are not going to be, that are not enrolled on Medicaid. As a result of this mandate, we're going to see more people come on to Medicaid. And when you look at the cost of Medicaid over this six year period, that's what we're talking about from 2014 when the Affordable Care Act starts to 2020 when it goes down to this 90% match, you're talking about us needing approximately uh, $2.4 billion just to maintain our maintenance effort with no expansion right now. And you think about that, you've been in the legislature for a long time and I've been here since 2001 and our budget has not grown $2.4 billion in state revenues over that period of time. So, you know, we've got to first control what, we're, what we have with Medicaid now. But then additionally, when we talk about expansion, you're talking about having, you know, one thing that we, that we don't know right now is what all the Affordable Care Act's gonna mean to this state. Nobody's figured it out. There's, you know, we got health exchanges and that's a whole nother issue, but those aren't created yet. We, we, no one knows how the health exchanges are gonna pay, what, how this gonna affect the currently insured. All we know is we're trying to model estimates here. And so when you model this, somewhere the additional cost of expansion to the state over the six year period is gonna be somewhere between $613 million to $1.9 billion. So that's another financial burden to the state that we can't sustain. And what we tell people is we've got to prioritize when we deal with budgets. We're constitutionally required to balance a budget in this state. And when we do that, we've got to make decisions on where we're going to, where we're going to spend our money. And unless we get a control of the HHS budget and reduce Medicaid and, and not do this expansion, then we're going to not be able to fund roads, education, police, all those other issues. And so that's, you know, that's really the main issue that we have is the cost that it's going to require for this state to maintain expansion. All right. I, must have, I must, if I may, respond to just a couple of points that uh, Mr. Smith made. Uh, the fact that we don't know about the exchanges, we need to look to the executive branch for that. They took a million dollar planning grant from the federal government, did not return the money, and the whole purpose of that planning grant was to say, this is how South Carolina will deal with the issue of Medicaid expansion or not deal with. I would remind viewers that when all of this discussion first started, the position of our executive branch was let South Carolinians decide what works best for South Carolina. We took the million bucks, we have not planned anything that we seem to be implementing. The second point, as far as the exchange, all of these people who are railing against the Affordable Care Act, one point that they seem to have missed is that come 2014, guess what? The feds are coming in here and creating the federal version of a health exchange. So it is amazing to me how all of these people who are convinced that it is wrong 
for the federal government to take over our planning and our exchange, somehow the fact that they are going to take it over uh, in January of 2014, nobody seems to be focused on that. And I am just amazed at that. Final point on the cost, <laughs> pay me now or pay me later. Uh, it is ridiculous in my view for us as South Carolinians to say that for the first three years, 100% of covering poor working people who are winding up in our emergency rooms, that we're going to turn that money back, let California, New York, and all these other states, we pay, Mr. Smith, federal taxes. Why can't we in South Carolina benefit? Why are we sending our tax dollars to insure other people in other states? It's just not fair. You wish you respond. Well, let, <laughs> we're going to do this the whole show. But let me, let me do, uh, the one thing I want to say is when I hear this argument, when we pay taxes, we ought to be able to get our money back. But I would remind my friend over here that the federal government is not running a balanced budget. They're borrowing this money for health care and they're borrowing this money for Medicaid. And so, you know, this is not money that's getting paid in and coming right back out. This is money that's getting paid in, borrowed, and then it's coming back out. And I think when you look in this state, and one of the most telling things, and we've seen this time and time again, and, and Director Keck is doing a wonderful job of pointing this out, is you look at the health disparities in this state. And both of us come from counties that have tremendous health disparities over there. And, and per capita, our counties, and you go down the I-95 corridor, has per capita most people enrolled on Medicaid. And per capita, we have the worst health outcomes in this state. So, so what, you know, giving somebody health insurance does not improve their health. And I think that's been proven time and time again. There's a number of studies. What we need to concentrate on is improving health, improving efficiency, and in the Medicaid system, I don't think anyone can argue that there's not inefficiency, waste, fraud in there. I mean, you've seen some numbers that come out from, from the Kaiser and other uh, folks who study this Medicaid system, they're about $713 billion of waste in the st system nationwide. And so we, there's ways we can improve the health outcomes. I'm sure we're going to get to that. We are. And I, I want to talk with both of you, all the alternatives, all the reforms to Medicaid. And before we go, so that w for, for our viewers, the hospitals, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, got money from the federal government to take care of, right. of uninsured called the disproportionate right. share right. monies. Mm -hmm. And they also got some supplements from Medicare. Now, the hospitals are complaining in, in their argument as to why we should take it, that they're going to end up on the negative side because they still won't get stuck with the uninsured. The, the, the question I ask both of you is, first of all, is it true that under the, regardless of whether we should or shouldn't take it, the disproportionate share of money is going to be reduced to the hospitals. So the question is, then how do they absorb it or will it be absorbed because of changes in the system or whatever and uh, or will it get charged back to private insurance payers across South Carolina and, and I hear all of those arguments and if y'all could kind of from your perspective tell us what, what's right and wrong about that. Well that's a very complex question <laughs> but let me tell you first I want to point out that if you look at any payer mix Medicaid does not pay for the cost of delivering care. Everyone agrees with that. So adding more people on Medicaid is still going to create a burden on, on uh, facilities, hospitals, and other providers. But dealing with, dealing with the DISH payment, at the initial uh, argument that came from the hospitals is DISH is going down and we've got to do something about that. Well, it, we, we found out now the federal government's come out and there's not going to be a reduction in the DISH payments for the first three years. They're going to continue having DISH payments and continue having the uncompensated care. You're going to see we currently have about 710,000 uninsured people and after the Affordable Care Act that comes into play in the state, that number is going to be reduced to about 210, 215,000 when we don't do expansion, if we don't do expansion. So hospitals are going to have more payers coming in the system, either through private insurance or either through health exchanges. And so their dish payments are going to remain the same. They currently receive about 57 percent 
of uncompensated care on this. So, you know, in the short term, there is not going to be a large effect on the hospitals. In the long term, there is going to be some reduction. It's not going to be the elimination of DISH. It's going to be the reduction of about 39% long term. But I also point out that we in South Carolina don't fully fund our DISH program. So, you know, we don't maximize the amount that we, that we can match right now. So your max, your, the reduction is coming off your maximum cap, so it's not going to be as catastrophic. And the last thing I want to point out to it is, you know, lost in this debate is that, you know, it's not only hospitals that we're talking about with Medicaid expansion. And it's not only physicians. You know, there are a lot of other entities that are involved in Medicaid, nursing homes, are disabled through DDSN, you know, that's 20% of our Medicaid budget. Uh, community residential care centers, adult daycare, I mean, the list goes on, and I'm sure you're familiar with it through your agent. And, um, and you know, there are, I'm starting to hear from a lot of these entities that are expressing concerns. If we expand, what is that going to mean? That's going to probably mean a reduction in our reimbursements because every state that has expanded already or has provided generous Medicaid uh, eligibility require, uh, allowables has had to reduce payments to providers because when you have people enrolled, there's only one way to reduce the budget in Medicaid, and that is to reduce the reimbursements. Well, Your take on that. Thank you. Of course, we've already reduced, and through our budget, we've already given Director Keck permission to reduce rates to providers, so that's nothing new here in South Carolina. Uh, Mr. Smith made a whole lot of, of comments that we don't have time for me to go into. Let me just boil it down to this from my perspective. As someone who represents an area where we're not quite a rural hospital and we're not large enough to be an urban hospital, we're kind of caught in betwixt and between. Bottom line is the Regional Medical Center of Orangeburg County covers, sees people who don't have health insurance. The disproportionate share has helped. It will be reduced. Three years may not be a long time for hospitals that are in the green, but for ho or in the black rather, who have green and making a profit. But for hospitals like ours and a lot of other rural hospitals, are we saying that those 16 hospitals, 17 on the list, that they can wait for three years? Let me though just because I know we're running out of time, let me share with the audience an area we agree on. Direct two things. One, all of this is a matter of just political, a philosophical disagreement. It's not one right or one wrong. I want to point out something that we were able to do in the budget that is not, in my view, a substitute for expanding Medicaid can't be considered that, but under the leadership of Chairman Merrill and working with Director Keck, we put money in the budget for the federally qualified health centers. That system has been struggling for years in this state to see and has been seeing uninsured patients. What we have done is not everything that would give them 100% coverage, but we have in the budget put money in there that will help them see people who have no health insurance. The other thing is I'm hopeful that given some of the conversations that are being held offline, that we're going to start actively working with partners in a variety of areas to make sure that we can educate our uh, constituency about their role and how they can change their habits. And as far as this Medicaid fraud, I've been hearing that chestnut for almost as long as I've been in the legislature. It would appear to me that for as many years as we've been talking about Medicaid fraud, my God, in a little small state like South Carolina, if we still got a significant amount of savings from Medicaid fraud, that tells us something about our role as oversight. We only got about five minutes left in the oh, broadcast, wow. and you just touched on it, so let me go to it. You proposed some alternatives to taking it. One of them was, I think, about $35 million to hospitals to steer people away from emergency rooms into, what, free health clinics. Is, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, and, and that's is something that we work with the governor's office and Director Keck on, and is we all agree, and I, I, I agree with uh, Representative Cobb Hunter, I don't think that this is an alternative to expansion. This is a way forward that we've got to improve efficiency. And when we talk about fraud in there, you know, it's inefficiency, waste, fraud. It's not all lumped in there together. But we know that one of the biggest drivers in our health care costs 
is the uninsured coming to the emergency rooms to seek primary care. And so what we're trying to do is to work with our fairly qualified health centers, our free clinics, our rural clinics, because that's what they're set up for. Mm -hmm. They're set up for to help provide primary care to uninsured and have case management managers work together in providing the primary care to them instead of them coming into the emergency rooms. And that's and so what we're trying to do is to incentivize payments to hospitals and work with the uh, FQHCs to move the people over there. And you're going to see that a lot of emergency room care is truly not emergency care. I'm, I'm someone who does my legal practice is defending hospitals and doctors, and I can't tell you the number of cases I see of people coming in the hospital who do not need, they're just looking for sore throats, primary care. So that's what we've got to try to work on that efficiency, move those people into uh, centers that are set up to provide primary care, and we all agree from the hospital associations to Representative Cobb Hunter and to the governor that that's going to reduce our Medicaid costs. You support his alternative? Or? We work together on it, even though he didn't give Democrats any credit. You know, <laughs> we have the philosophy that you would be surprised at what you can get done when you don't care who gets credit for it. My bad, and, and certainly <laughs> they did, and Representative Harriot was a big, uh, he's on my subcommittee and worked well with us. Well, very quickly, we only got about three minutes left. How about the $20 million at, to, a, to, what, to 100% to pay 100% of the rural hospitals? Um, uh, uncompensated care. Tell us very quickly about that. Well, that's what the governor proposed in her state of state address is that the rural hospitals who are really struggling, instead of receiving 57 percent of uh, for their uncompensated care, they will receive 100 percent. That will hopefully hopefully stabilize them short term. There are other long term measures that we're looking at uh, in that's been in the alternative, but that will help stabilize them. So are the big hospitals no only getting 57 percent? I mean, like the one she described in Orangeburg or down in Charleston or Greenville or somewhere? And Sumter. Uh, and yeah. Sumter, too. So they're, they're only getting 57 percent reimbursement for yes, uncompensated That's care. Correct. The question of rural hospitals need to be asked, and I know they've all signed some kumbaya on this little money they're getting. You heard the chairman talk about three years. Uh, they're going to wait this thing out or whatever. The rural hospitals need to be asking themselves, is this money going to last me for three years so we can see what the lay of the land is. I don't think that that's enough money to keep them open and I, while I applaud it and see it as a, as a starting point, it is in no way, it should in no way be considered a way to keep these hospitals open. We still have a crisis, in my opinion, with our rural hospitals and we've got hospitals that have already shut down in the governor's hometown of Bamberg. So very quickly, we're almost out of time. We've got one minute left. The new program that you're talking about, it's about $62 million. Where's, where will that money come from? Well, that's $62 million total dollars. Total okay? dollars. And so obviously that match under what you talked about is state revenue, but the uh, Tony Keck has run a, has had a reserve and we provided him a reserve last year and so that's where some of this money is going for and then using it forward but conceivably all this should pay for itself when you reduce the cost of Medicaid uh, reimbursements and I mean not reimbursements but cost in providing these services. Well unfortunately we're out of time. You've done oh, a great wow. job of really time starting flies. to straighten the surface of a very before, complex before. issue and you can see why there's debate here in Columbia on this question. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back with other issues here at the State House. Oh, wow. Oh, come on. We have to go. Broadcast of this program is made possible in part by the South Carolina Farm Bureau online at scfb.org and by the Columbia Metropolitan Airport online at columbiaairport.com and by Time Warner Cable, online at timewarnercable.com.